thank you all for coming out. Um, Glenn, thanks for making them have to do it for class. Um, <laughs> uh, I am glad to be here, and um, I found myself um, where somewhere like there on the map. And uh, it's a privilege for me to be in Kansas. I realized that uh, I had never followed Dorothy and Toto's, Toto to this space. So, um, I'm very great, grateful to have made it and, um, and, and, and just glad to, to be able to be with you. Uh, I, I'm not going to mention that it's 77 degrees back in Pasadena. And I, I checked, I checked. To, to see what, what the temperature was here, because I needed to know how to pack. And on Saturday, your temperature was the same as it was in Pasadena. And then I landed here today. <laughs> Saw the t-shirt in the airport gift shop that said, if you don't like the weather, wait five minutes. I liked it on Saturday. <laughs> and since I'm originally from Chicago, I am now over my desire to be back in the Midwest in April. Thank you very much. <laughs> Gracious God, we thank you for minds to think, hearts to believe in your gospel, which is good news for all the world. In these next few lectures, we ask that your spirit might intrude in our imaginations, turn our worlds over again, that we might imagine your reality, that we might be glimpses of your glory. We ask this for as best as we know ourselves, we want to be fully human, image bearers of holiness. In Christ's name, and for the sake of the world he died for, we seek you. Amen. Amen. So, I don't know if um, having gotten here that wasn't me. <laughs> it's like, I think. Uh, um, I don't know uh, about being here, but you may sometimes, when you are thinking about this whole idea of what it means in a world that is on YouTube and Facebook, and as I'm looking out on you, I know that's normal for you, but I came around before that was normal. I'm as old as Glenn, actually he worked for me, so that's not even true, you know? So, but but we, we used to do things differently, and there's this question about, you know, in this virtual reality world, which, which way is up? And, and sometimes we're wandering, wandering around as the church, sort of scratching our head, and, and I don't know, maybe, maybe you might find yourself feeling a little bit like these two.
surely there's another way. And I may be old fashioned, but I'm willing to believe that this idea of proclamation for a virtual reality, being a people of an ancient book in a contemporary context might just work. But we've got to stop doing things the way we thought they needed to be done and be open to allowing the prayer that I just prayed to be the prayer of your heart. And that is that Christ would intrude again in our hearts and imaginations. The question for us today is, are we willing to have Jesus show up in our world, in our lives, and turn it upside down the way he did in the first century? I mean, they weren't all going to Sunday school very happy to have this new Jesus Christ come along. They were kind of shocked. And the gospel is kind of, well, it kind of rocks your world. And if we as Christians aren't acting like it's rocking our world, uh, the world kind of thinks we're kind of silly. So I, I got to admit, there's, we've been having this conversation for a long time, trying to deal with a changing world, a changing church, a changing reality. Years ago, there was a fellow by the name of Bill Eason. And uh, he wrote all kinds of books that everyone was reading in search of strategies for church survival and um, re reinventing the church for the uh, 21st century. He did this back in the 20th century, way back then. And he was writing books that, that had provocative titles like um, uh, Put on Your Own Oxygen Mask First or Dancing with Dinosaurs or uh, uh, sacred cows made gourmet burgers. Uh, some folks are remembering. Uh, uh, he was one of those folks at the at the end of the 21st century who signaled that there was a shift in how we needed to do church today. And and, and some of you may um, know some other folks that are that are doing that. We um, actually are still reading pastors of mega churches. Uh, they they have names like uh, Adam Hamilton. Um, but this isn't just a situation that's uh, going on um, in um, the um, Methodist church. You may have heard of a Mark Driscoll or um, maybe a Rob Bell. Uh, and uh, all of these guys are, are writing things, asking questions, and, and we know that they're working because when, when, when you have them to do a Cheney lecture, I mean, they pack out stadiums. Um, and, and it's basically because they're guaranteed to say something to, well, there's some adults in the room, so I better not say it that way, to make your blood pressure go up. Um, they're they're going to say something that's really off the chain. And, and, and they, they, they're being provocative because they're asking questions. Well, they're actually questions that the church needs to be asking. We are living in a time of a changing church. And it's important for us to begin to, I can't see that. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, oh, okay. And so it's important for us to be able to realize that the church actually goes through great transition uh, about every 500 years or so. Phyllis Tickle has written a book called The Great Emergence, and she says that these, these dramatic changes that are happening in the institution of the church are sort of like cleaning out the <clears throat> attic every 500 years or so. It's, it's a great book that sort of goes through the history of these major changes that have gone on in the church, uh, the Reformation and going back before that, uh, why there's a Catholic church and a Greek Orthodox church, and, and just taking uh, in, in sight the, the, the various changes of which we're in the midst right now. And, and so one of the things that we can trust about God is God sustained God's people back then, which is why we're God's people right now. And if we continue to trust God, then there'll be folks in, behind us who have found us faithful, who will trust in God's faithfulness. So the, the question is not, are we in the midst of change, or is that good or bad? Change happens. I got on a plane this morning, and I thought that I was supposed to get on the next plane at 110. And when I landed on my plane, I sent a desperate text message to our email um, to Glenn because I got this announcement on my phone that my plane had taken off two hours earlier while I was in the air on the first connection. 
there was a problem, they fixed it, I'm here, I'm grateful. <laughs> but the reality is, is that we live in a world of <coughs> constant, unexpected things. The only thing that we can guarantee is change. So as the church, we should be able to say, God is God, then, now, and forever. I think there's a text for that, but I'm not at the biblical interpretation part yet. So I want to look at some of these uh, things, and, and, and basically what I've decided to do is to take it from the perspective of proclamation for a virtual reality. Um, and that's what we'll be talking about tonight. But I, I'm particularly going to take it from uh, some things that I learned. I think the next slide is wrong. But anyway, I'm going to particularly take it from some things that uh, I learned from reading The Hunger Games. And so I've got to remember uh, to ask whether or not any of you have um, read. Okay, your hands went up. Now they tell me a movie came out. Anybody see the movie? Wow, more yeah. hands came up. Amazing. <laughs> I'm going to talk to the people that read the book, the rest of you. No. <laughs> um, just the fact that more hands went up with the watching of the movie than the reading of the book tells me something about reading the Bible. The world is watching the video clip of God's testimony that's us before they're reading God's book. No pressure, <laughs> just saying. So um, I, I want to put a little context around what we have. Okay, maybe that is right. That one's wrong. Okay, so the context for those of you whose hands didn't go up either for the reading or for the watching, um, The Hunger Games is a book by Suzanne Collins, and um, she actually works in the industry, which is now what I call Hollywood because I live out there. It is so cool. It's warm out there. No, I'm not talking about that. So, uh, what Suzanne Collins was doing, she actually works in the midst of this reality that she, her book critiques. But she, she was channel surfing one day, and, and she went from a scene that was, you know, one of these, you know, crazy reality shows, and then hit the remote and wound up looking at live scenes from the war in the Middle East. And that jarring reality from the silliness of how the industry makes people angry by depriving them of sleep and making sure that you know what will tee them off and then asking them those questions on camera when they're with the other people who haven't slept, who are also teed off by the question that was asked a few moments ago. And then they fit back and roll the cameras to see how are you going to survive that or you know what, what your life is going to be like on, on this reality show. That, that, that's what they're doing. They're sensational lot, sensational. I speak for a living. <laughs> Thank you. My tongue can't spell that, but I appreciate the help. Um, so, so they're sensationalizing. Thank you very much. Um, all of this, because that's what we'll watch. But on the same television, in the same moment, we can see the reality of people's lives being lost because of the violence that is real, because of governments because of economies, because of failure on the parts of humans that we did not intend, and because of intentional acts. Mm -hmm. And you might think, I am thinking about the plant that uh, blew up outside of uh, Waco and Boston Marathon. So that reality, while we're paying people money to do stupid things on television, and Suzanne Collins got to thinking about that and, and, and decided that she wanted to write a story about it. So she wrote a trilogy. The first one is called The Hunger Games. It's a book. Movie came out. Second one is called Catching Fire. Book movie's about to come out. Um, invite you, if you want to be ready for it, to um, read the book one and two so you can see the movie. I think reading the book will make you read, see the movie a whole lot differently. But I'm not going to talk about that until tomorrow. <laughs> that was a personal commercial. Um, so um, before I talk a little bit about what the, the Hunger Games actually says, let me, let me just 
point to this idea. Um, that says entertained to boredom. Um, we're going to change the, uh, I'm, I might have a question for you so we can take a break and I can change the thing. But I'll, I'll read as, as much as I can. Uh, a few years ago, there was a book written by a fellow by the name of Neil Postman, Amusing Ourselves to Death. Um, mm, now we get a couple of half nods. Uh, oh, some folks are, have you guys heard of The Shallows by Nicholas Carr? Mm, no. Yes, okay. It's on, yes. It's on my got, desk. Got a, couple of those, got a couple of nods on there. Carr kind of brings Postman up. He, he kind of goes through Postman to bring it up. A, a guy whose name I cannot pronounce, Thomas Denzengoshi, or something like that, Z-E-N-G-O-I-T-T-A, something like that, Mediated. If you enjoy Carr, you're going to like Mediated a whole lot, so put that on your to-read list. The rest of you read Postman. <laughs> <laughs> So there's another book, if you haven't read Postman, I know that you probably haven't heard of, and that would be, well, let me see if you've heard of this one, 1984? <laughs> <laughs> okay, I was gonna ask you, where am I? <laughs> um, so 1984, how about Huxley's A Brave New World? A few more nods? Okay, I'm gonna do a comparison between Huxley's Brave New World and Orwell's 1984, because that's what Postman does at the beginning of his book. And basically, what, basically, basically, I'm a United Methodist, and they say we can't speak in tongues. <laughs> <laughs> Problem is, I seem to need an interpreter. To uh, so, um, what Postman <laughs> describes are or Orwell's fears, and for those of you who are familiar with the Hunger Games, what I call Huxley's panem. So he's making a comparison years ago when Postman's book came out, and he wrote this book where he described what uh, George Orwell put forth in 1984 and what Adolf Huxley put off in uh, Brave New World. And first of all, you have this idea what Orwell feared in 1984 of books being banned, the banning of books. But in Huxley's Brave New World, it was just a lack of reading. In 1984, we were deprived, the fear was being deprived of information. But for Huxley, too much information. I think you're going to see where this is going. Orwellian's fears were a concealment of the truth. Huxley described relevance. In 1984, they were controlled by pain. But what a brave new world puts before us is being controlled by pleasure. And so the greatest fear was that we would be ruined by the things we hate. But Huxley said, our ruin are the things that we love. And what Postman does is to say that we went to great lengths to prevent 1984 from happening in 1984. But we didn't bother to protect ourselves from the brave new world. And the reason I call it Huxley's panel, because I think Suzanne Collins has captured our reality by saying, there's no reading that's going on in, in the Hunger Games. They have all kinds of information that they are forced to watch. We'll talk a little bit more about those specifics. Some of that information for them is irrelevant, but they have to pay attention to it at least once a year when the games come on. And for us, and for the capital city, we're controlled, not by pain, but by pleasure. The things we like, the things we love, are what ruin us. In fact, if you have a biblical imagination, which I'm going to dare to begin and say, you don't, you come back at me on that. I'll prove my point in a moment. <laughs> if you have a biblical imagination, then you know we didn't need 
we didn't need Postman or Huxley to point this out, nor did we need Suzanne Collins, because the Bible reveals that where our heart is reveals what matters to us. And when our heart is not centered on the God revealed in Christian scripture, then what we have is idolatry. Right. And that is what ruins humanity. Whether that I is money or fame or self, that I stepping in front of the place that should only be held by the creator God made known in Jesus Christ, it ruins us. In order to understand that, we have to accept that what the Bible presents to us is an understanding of the world through an understanding of the word. And I don't mean a word that is filled with principles and tips and techniques. I mean a word that is brought to us by narrating a reality, inviting us to be narrated in. That's what scripture does for the world. It's God's story. And our four parents walked out on it, ate themselves out of house and home, actually. <laughs> but God has been editing the narrative to bring them back in. It's a story. It's not a bunch of principles. It's not a bunch of rules. It's what the world is looking for. Why is this children's book? The Hunger Games was not written for your age group. Well, actually, when it came out, it probably was written for your age group. It's been out a few years. But it's, it's not a book that's written for my age group. And yet, it has captivated enough for Hollywood to say, I'm going to make a movie of this because it'll sell, and it is. What we love is a story. And the interesting thing about the stories Hollywood are trying to tell, they're trying to tell stories that have high fidelity. fidelity. Now, for some of the older people in the room, that's a hi-fi, which is a technical term for our musical devices long before the iPod. Um, but when we talked about high fidelity, what that meant was there was this thing called a radio. That's your grandparents. Uh, and um, it had a dial instead of numbers. And what you did was you turned the dial, and when you got to the place where you got the best signal, and consequently the best sound, it was the true station. It was high fidelity. Fidelity being truthfulness. That's our word for it, actually. Truthful. But what the world is looking for is this fidelity thing. The other thing a good story does that, that, that Hollywood likes to tell is to have a story that is moving, a story that's going somewhere. You don't want to pick up a book that says, this is the end. <laughs> well, actually, maybe you would if it was for Glenn's class, but yeah. other than that. <laughs> um, my ticket is not till tomorrow night, so all of you who clap are going to have to make sure I get to work tomorrow because you have to send me on now. <laughs> that takes us somewhere. We want our characters to be maturing, to be choosing, to be changing, to be risking. We want movement. And that in the biblical story is the transcendence and the telos of the story that is not simply that I got wet right and have a certificate in a drawer that means when I die I get pie in the pie in the sky. It means that God is working in this world to complete his creation project. That's our telos. We call that the kingdom. But, but that's a good Christianese term, or it's a term that you would use in England to make the queen feel very good. <laughs> but what that means to us in North America is it means that God has never given up on the creation project. It means that we are moving toward God's end. 
It means that we are moving toward good. It means that what we see now is not what we get later. It means that the brokenness of now is not God's original intention and it's not going to be God's final project. And the invitation for us is to move along that story. We're in the middle of a story right now. The end was not when you said, I'm a Christian and I'm going to go to Central Christian College. The end will not be when you get your degree. The end will not be when you get your MRS. For guys, that means getting your wife. For women, that means getting a husband, which I failed to do, so I'm still on that train. But <laughs> that's a prayer request if you think about me. <laughs> I've lost that 800 number. I'm getting all the help I can. <laughs> but, but, but we're moving toward God's good end. And so this story we have is the story Hollywood's trying to tell. Another good thing about stories is intimacy. Now, there are other words I could have used for that one. You know what sells. There once was an uh, old, um, this is for some of the folks who are in my age category, old, old set of uh, 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 comics called Mad Magazine. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right, I got some lab. Really remember. Okay, so some of you are good on you. Yeah. Um, I usually know I can get folks looking at Nick at night if I do a television show, but I'm really glad I got, got someone that, that knows Mad Magazine. So they had this. They did, they did all this. It was, um, it was um, before Saturday Night Live put it on television. You know, Mad Magazine kind of did that kind of stuff. And, and so they had this cartoon, and in one frame there was uh, this um, great story about to happen. And uh, there were these characters, and you could tell that there, there, there was going to be this just wonderful, um, um, I, I don't know, it was like maybe a war. Okay, so, you, so you've got these folks that are, are, are about to beat up on each other. And, and then you've got this next scene where they have all of their riches. And, and so you, you find out that this war is going to be very well funded. And then in the next scene, you have a very attractive woman and a very attractive man in bed together. They weren't in the other two. And then in the next frame, the people that were in the war in the first frame are looking back at the people in the bed in that last frame like... And the caption says, what was that? And the other person says, ratings. <laughs> <laughs> so they, we use sex to sell. Thank you. <laughs> uh, we use, that was a Mad Magazine, not mine. Uh, we use sex to sell. But we're also revealing a desire. You know, we might say, that we don't care about relationships in this context, in our contemporary context. We might say that a hookup is all we want, but the reality is every movie that sells tells the story of the guy getting the girl. Have you paid attention to that? In a culture that says it doesn't matter, the best stories are those old-fashioned love stories. And they're not just chick flicks. You guys like taking us to see it. <laughs> <laughs> but what we call that is more than just the sex to sell or the hookup. The only time in this story God said, oops, in all of creation was when he made man. As a girl, I like to say it that way. <laughs> Let me rewind. And uh, <laughs> let me try, let me try to get back to the Hebrew. Um, what it actually says is that when God created the human one, God said, I don't think so. That's what it really says. And, and so I can have fun. As a girl saying, you know, God made a man, and he went, I didn't mean to do that. I can do better. <laughs> but the truth is, what God said was not God's intention, was that we would be individuals, that we would be alone, right. that we would have to strive alone, that we would have to deal with reality alone. God said that's not good. And so God immediately formed in God's image, male and female, and brought the two different together 
so that we would have community. And I love this part of the story because God didn't say be friends because you have kindergarten friends, you have high school friends, you have college friends. Those of us who have been out in the work world have work friends from five years ago, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, 20 years ago. Okay, I'm gonna stop. Um, <laughs> And, and friends are great for seasons in your life. My grandmother said, if you have good friends that you can count on one hand, you are blessed. Mm -hmm. Now, we got a whole bunch of friends. I got 2,157. <laughs> <laughs> but but, but um, those are not the people that I struggle with. Those are not the people that I cry with. Those are not the people that I'm most honest with. Those are not the people that know every crack and crevice in my life. Okay, they know every plane I get on. <laughs> but I'm talking about what my grandmother was talking about were those people who walk through you who's thick and thin. And basically, those moments happen at various stages in your life, like elementary school and junior high in high school, in college, and this job, and that job, and this neighborhood, and this deployment. But God didn't say, be friends. God did not say, be therapists. And I'm at Fuller, we have a school of psychology, so I had to fly several hours so that I could say this out loud. But God did not say, I'm gonna give you somebody in your life that you pay $115 an hour for and you can tell them anything that you need to tell them and they will tell you that you're okay. <laughs> okay, that's a very bad understatement. But God didn't set up a relationship we have to purchase. God didn't set up a relationship that comes and goes in our life. God set up a relationship called family through God's design of marriage, where you not only get in-laws, you get outlaws. I know that's not on the, the, the license or anything like that, but you've been to Thanksgiving dinners and they show up. And because of blood, you're related. And for those of you who, like myself, are adopted, I don't know anything about my biological parents except for with all the work they're doing right now on DNA, I know that they could track my blood and find somebody that I've never seen who has no idea that I exist and tell us we're cousins. Mm -hmm. That's God's design for community. And it even gets better than that because for us, that community happens around the family table. And I don't mean Thanksgiving this time. I, I mean that table we come together at called community, where we become the body of Christ. And that is life giving. That story that is true, that is intimate, that is worth dying for, and therefore gives us a reason to live. That's the story Hollywood is trying to tell. We don't have to try to tell it. We don't have to be Walt Disney to create a Disneyland. Do you know that you can work for Disneyland and they call you actor? They call you part of the storytelling. But you don't have to create a new story. Walt's already done that. All you have to do is be willing to put on a princess and an out, out, outfit or maybe uh, Mickey Mouse ears and point to what Walt has done. That's our job, folks. That's why I prayed that we could be fully human. Because what does it mean to be fully human? <coughs> it means to be image bearers of God. Now, so when somebody looks at you and says you're a dirtbag, say thank you, because <laughs> it's true. God labored over a lump of clay and donated dignity to dirt. And then said, you're good. You're good. You're very good. God loves us when we were dirt because God knows our birthmark. It says we are made in the divine image.
Now that's a story worth telling. Mm -hmm. So we have this story that unfortunately has never been told. And, and I want to suggest a reason for why that story hasn't been told. By pointing again to this idea of the Hunger Games and asking a simple, okay, none of my questions are really simple, but a simple question. What kind of people are we forming? Because if God says we're to be community, and ultimately the story ends with the body of Christ gathered together, then, then what kind of people are we forming as image bearers of God? Best way to form a people is to tell a story. <coughs> tell a good story, a passionate story, a truthful story, a story of coming together, of moving along. But we actually prefer research. We prefer facts. We prefer information. And so um, I'm going to bring up a book of that. Oh my goodness, it wasn't a good book for us. A few years ago, Dave Kinnaman and Gabe Lyons wrote a book called Unchristian. They interviewed, well, actually your age group, who weren't in the church, and they asked the question, what do you think of Christians? And the answers that Lyons and Kenneman got could only best be described as unchristian. So that's what they titled their book. When asked what the people outside of the church saw by the community we were, they talked about us being judgmental, playing with rules, talked about us being too involved in politics, partisan politics, mean-spirited partisan politics. They talked about us being anti-gay, and that's a big problem for this generation. They don't understand what we're trying to say about family because we don't understand what we're trying to say about family. We don't understand what we're trying to say about marriage. And maybe Glenn will lose his job on this one, so he didn't know I was going to say this. I'm going to say it. We lost the marriage battle a long time ago. We lost the marriage battle when we said okay to divorce and stopped talking about it. We lost the conversation that we're trying to have right now when the divorce statistics were higher among Christians than they are for people not in the church. We lost the marriage conversation when, when we thought eHarmony.com was the best way to go. Because if you look at what that says, it says we're looking for somebody to make us happy. And Gary Taylor in his book has it right. What if marriage isn't to make us happy, but to make us whole? What if being married is being the male and female coming together, different, but working at being image bearers of God? Which means the center of our marriage is not my happiness or whether or not I look good with this person standing on the side of me. <laughs> but it's whether or not together God gets a shout out. Well. I could get in a whole lot of trouble if I stay on that one. So what else did they find out? Uh, they found out about uh, they found out about this generation that thinks very poorly of the church and decided to go back and ask, well, what do folks who grew up in the church think about the church? And you know what? The facts there weren't any better. And they titled that book, You Lost Me. Because this generation who grew up in the church, and maybe some of you are hiding this, sitting in this room right now, the truth is, all of that Christianese, all of that traditional talk lost you. And when you went home and you said to your parents, I'm not sure I believe this Jesus thing, 
They freaked out, called a priest, and you're not even Catholic, had them lay hands on you to exercise that demon out of you. They got blessed handkerchiefs and then caught you. Handkerchief. <laughs> yeah, handkerchiefs, that's right. They got, I saw something else in my head. <laughs> they got blessed handkerchiefs and prayed over you and made you feel like you had already died and gone to hell. <laughs> so you didn't tell them what your questions were. Of course, that wouldn't be you because you're at Central Christian College. So your friends, folks you went to camp with, youth group with, who aren't in church, who aren't talking to their parents. That, that's the generation that was lost. And that's what Kinnaman found out. And I'm going to put his thoughts against some thoughts I heard from Diana Butler Bass, who took statistics that were done about church going and found out that Catholics aside, the largest growing group of faith claims are nuns. That's not Catholic nuns. I say Catholics aside. That would be N-O-N-E. When people are asked what their religious affiliation is, they say none. But the problem with that is what we don't understand is that that group is not saying they're not interested in things religious. They're just saying they're not a Affiliated because the denominations, the institution, the organized church lost them. But they don't know what story to tell. They don't know how to live in God's reality because that story isn't being brought to their imagination again. And so they live in what Diana Butler Bass calls a post theistic reality. And I say that is because we do not have a biblical imagination. And that's a dangerous place to be a young person. That's the world of the Hunger Games. A world where in book one, two, or three, even though in the first movie there's a moment where she says, oh Christ, or oh Jesus, something like that. It's a curse word, not a calling on the Lord. But it's very interesting that people who don't believe in God, when they stub their toe, the first person they call to heal the pain is Jesus. <laughs> I'm just saying. But other than that, in her book, there is nothing about any theism. This is an interesting context to have to be telling God's story. The world that we live in, who wants spirituality, but not Jesus, and definitely not the one Jesus calls Father. But they, they want to have some type of experience, but not the one we talk about in the church. That's the culture that you've got to preach Jesus in. And it's dangerous for youth because in the Hunger Games, for those of you who don't know the story, the capital city won the war when all the districts, the 12 districts had decided that they would rebel against the capital city. And the capital city who had all the resources won. And the 12 districts are made up of what resembles North America. It's in our future. And so there's a community that bakes bread. And there's a community that mines coal. And there's a community that takes care of all of the needs of the capital city. And those communities that have all the resources for the capital city live in poverty. They don't have access to the food they grow, the things they bake, the coal they mine. It's all for the capital city. And when they gathered together to rebel and lost, the capital city decided that they would remind them every year never to try and do it again. And so the way that they did that was every year they have what they call a game, the Hunger Games which meant that on reaping day, in every district, all of the children between the age of 12 and 18 were to put their name into, it wasn't a hat, it was bigger than a hat because it was all the kids, but into the hat. 
and a boy and a girl from each of the districts would be chosen. And those two from each of the districts would be taken away to the capital city. And if it sounds like I think that that's supposed to be a great thing, that's the way the capital city thinks about it. They're taken away to the capital city so that they have the opportunity to see the riches and to see the world and to play in a game where of those 24 children, only one will come out alive. They are brought in, they're cleaned up, they're dressed up, they're fed, and all of this is televised so that everyone back home watches. And back home, we're watching because that's a little boy, a little girl from our community. And in the capital city, it's the Olympics. It's, the, it's March Madness. It, it's the playoffs. And, and they're excited. They're betting money on who's going to win. And, and, and they'll give gifts so that they can help their person win. It's all televised. It's a dangerous place to be a youth, to be between the ages of 12 and 18. What does that look like in our society? It looks like a baby I didn't intend on having right now. Dangerous place to be a child. It looks like a child that I brought into this world but is getting in the way of my education or my job and so I give that child a key and we call them latchkey kids and we send them home and I have a meeting, I have it's tickets to I'm so sorry. <laughs> um, um, the, we, give them, we give them a key because we have plans that evening and that child is being raised without a family without a heritage without a dinner table it's a dangerous place to be a child in this story we have a world where the parent in the Hunger Games, where the parents are not in control. Katniss, who's the girl that is the hero in this story, father was killed, and her mother basically had a psychotic breakdown. She couldn't handle it. So Katniss had to be responsible for her little sister. The children are raising the adults. And when Katniss volunteers to be the one who goes in her sister's stead to be in the Hunger Games, she tells her mother, as if she were the mother, you can't lose it now. You must stay strong. It's a dangerous place to be a youth. And yet Suzanne Collins has captured very much the world that is our world, that at least in the church, we ought to be telling a different story from. So I don't know if you noticed, but this generation, you're a little different than the generation I grew up in. And, and by that, I don't mean, and I have to read this, I don't mean that your multitasking, portable, handheld devices, entertainment, gaming, and random opinions of the 2,157 closest friends on your Facebook page. <laughs> what I mean is that you are a generation who have been taught to see the world differently. You were taught to dream about the way things could be. And you weren't reminded about why things are the way they are. John F. Kennedy had this idea. Let's do something different. Let's put a man on the moon. And let's do it in 10 years. And in 1968, we did. His brother had an idea. Let's do something different. He believed, as he was speaking about the racism that was going on and being 
filmed all around the world. The racism in Alabama and what was going on in Birmingham was giving America a bad reputation in the world. And so in a press conference, he said to the world, that's just a portion of what's going on in America. Everybody isn't in America isn't like that. In fact, the way things are going in America right now, there very well could be a Negro in the White House in 40 years. And in 2008, that Kennedy word was true as well. You're a generation who's been taught to dream about writing your own story. We taught you that. I don't know if you recognize this. I'm not taking orders. <laughs> but this Longberger jack jacket basket has made a lot of money for Dave. And he got the idea that, well, well, what if I were to build a building like the baskets I love? And everybody said, hey, man, that's a, that's a stupid idea. <laughs> but he didn't think it was impossible. And if you drive through Ohio right now, you will find this is the Lundberger corporate office. <laughs> the, um, the handles have heat elements in it because it gets cold in Ohio, much like it does here in Kansas, and so that's keep it from freezing. But there, um, there uh, 500 people work there. It's a real life building in Ohio. I'm still trying to figure out on what highway it is. I found that picture, but I want to see this, 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 this building. This is a world that has been taught whatever you dream you can make. Do you know we didn't have iPhones and iPods and Facebook 15 years ago? 15 years ago, 12 years, 12 years ago, 10 years ago. And I hate to tell you, the education that you're getting right now, five years after graduation, which is why you're asking for continuing education. Be lifelong learners, because that's what storytelling has always done for a community. It's made us lifelong learn learners. We live in a reality that tells stories and gives us people who see the world differently. <laughs> now, depending on whether or not you know the story, how I interpret this and how you interpret this might be different. If you happen to be familiar with C.S. Lewis, mm -hmm. then you got a real good interpretation for that. <laughs> but if you don't happen to know anything about Aslan, this little kitty really thinks a whole lot of himself. <laughs> <laughs> the only way that that reflection and that attitude is good is if it's shaped by the biblical narrative, which the Chronicles of Narnia are. The only way that this is an arrogance gone amok is if this little kitty knows I'm a dirt bag. I'm created in an image of good. That's who I am. You've got to be telling the right story for that reflection to be true and good. And I don't just mean good for you. I mean good for the world. Because we speak to a generation who doesn't know its history. A generation who doesn't know what it means to sit at the family table and to hear what I call grandparent stories. I, I, I don't know if this happens in your house, but I used to love to go down to see my father's mother. Because when we would go down there, my father, who was the tough one in the house, who said it and it happened, he would just sort of melt. You know? So I learned that when I would go down there, my grandmother would say, would you like some ice cream? If I looked to my mom and dad, they would say, and I would have to turn around and say, no, Grandma. And Grandma would say, let the girl have some ice cream. And my dad would say, she can have some ice cream. <laughs> <laughs> and while we're having ice cream, my grandmother's telling me stories about
about when my dad was a kid. And I don't know if the ice cream was good, but I do know that eating ice cream and listening to my grandmother was. Because my father would be like, don't tell her that. We're trying to make sure she doesn't do that. She just like you. I remember the time you went back out in the field and my father's like, please don't tell her about that one. She'll do that when we get home too. <laughs> My mother was bothered by the fact that I was just like my father, thanks to my grandmother. <laughs> we live in a generation of folks who haven't heard those stories. So there's a sad story of a young man who was in college. He was actually in the same college that his dad had gone to. And he was actually in the same program to become a medical doctor that his father had been in. And he was taking professors that his dad had taken. And he needed to finish this undergrad so he could go on to become a medical doctor to go to med school. And he flunked his class. And he didn't know how to tell his dad. He, he didn't know how to tell his mom. And he was devastated. He didn't know what else he could do. And he was suicidal. And he had a close enough relationship with his grandmother. Before he killed himself, he called his mother, grandmother up. And he said, Grandma, I, I just called to tell you I love you. And she could tell he was upset. And she said, what's going on? And he said, well, I, I, I flunked out. And she said, really? What class? And he told her, and she started to laugh. She said, your father flunked that class. Three times. <laughs> he didn't know his father had ever flunked anything. It took a grandparent story to understand that he really was like his father, not only when he succeeded, but also when he tripped, when he fell, when he stumbled, when he wobbled. Some friends of mine, you'll see their little cute little boy tomorrow. Some friends of mine have a have a, a little boy. It's always funny to watch parents with their newborns because the kid is like just learning how to hold on to the edge of the crib. Mm -hmm. And they're kind of leaning and mom, dad walks in the room. They get all excited and they don't know that their balance is lodged in their hand position on the edge of the crib. And when they see that familiar face, they let go, they reach up and they fall down. <laughs> But that is not what is recorded on their parents' Facebook page. <laughs> what is recorded is, my child walked today. <laughs> I was there. Your child did not walk. Your child fell. <laughs> There's no hope for this child. I never met a parent who, when the kid was born, said, look, he can't even find his mouth with his fingers. A failure. What did we produce? He'll never play football. Oh, my gosh, it's broken. Send it back. I've never seen a parent do that. I've always seen this high expectations. The kid falls, and they say that's the first step. The kid says, and they said the kid said Alaska. Is it not tall? <laughs> but that kind of parental expectation, that's what God has on you, dirtbags. God watches you stumble. God watches you get caught in the crevices. And God says, you're going to soar one day because I'll be the wind beneath your wings. That's a story worth telling. But we've got a generation who hasn't been shaped by this biblical imagination. Now, I told you I would prove, prove my point because I know some of you are thinking, we ain't done that. We know the Bible. I think Tyler Perry has something to say about that. I'm, 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 I'm just... I just yeah. think I think he's captured this. Okay? So you just you just sort of, we're gonna pray and then we're gonna hear a little bit about the Bible story. Tyler Perry from uh, I Can Do Bad All By Myself.
and she did a get to know you game by putting the names of Bible characters on their foreheads. And then the people had to come up and tell them things about them so they could guess who they were. And the kids in this church, these kids who had grown up in the church, they didn't know who da Daniel was, who Jonah was, who Joseph was, who Moses was. They'd been given all kinds of rules. This is how you pray, a stamp to get it up to heaven. That sounds like good stuff, and it's funny to laugh at because well, you must know something about the Bible because you laughed at the right parts. But we've been telling people how to live without simply giving them a story that makes God alive. And I want to say to you, in this virtual reality, in this world that is dangerous for children, in this world where we act as if we have no history and no heritage, that the best thing to do is to tell God's story. Because as Dennis Kinlaw, who was president of Asbury College, now Asbury University, once said, the parts of the Bible we don't highlight, that's God's word too. And my question for you is when you talk about the Bible, are you looking for things about yourself? Are you trying to figure out whether you're Mary or Martha, Peter or Paul? Are you allowing the Bible to be the revelation of God? I think in the idea of the Hunger Games, where Suzanne Collins has created this world that says when we put these children up to kill each other, we are going to make everybody watch, every man, woman, and child, the old folks to the youngest, if are forced to watch. It's an intergenerational thing. You know who's supposed to be intergenerational? We are. We're not supposed to have the youth in one service, the babies up in the nursery so that their parents have to listen in on a radio broadcast, and the big folks downstairs fighting over whether or not there's going to be a bass guitar, a drum, or a pipe organ. That, that's what our churches have become. What if church were the gathering of the family? I've seen this happen. I've participated in happening where I have spoken a word and an 11-year-old and a 77-year-old both say, I got something out of that. And you want to know why? It's because I don't preach about getting married. You know what I feel like when I go to a, a church and the sermon this morning is how to survive a divorce? It's like, come on, give me a break. I want to try it before you tell me it ain't going to work. <laughs> now, I don't, I don't talk about how to get seven strategies for success or leadership principles. I tell the story of a God who gets big verbs. How do you talk about God? God is good. What does that mean? God brings storms like Katrina. You call that good? God lets children die of AIDS in Africa or leaves them orphans as their parents die. You call that good? God needs angels in heaven and lets little children be killed by drunk drivers. You call that good? What do you mean when you say God is good? Well, well God is holy. Wesleyan context, what holiness in the 21st century? Now that's something you need to work on. But you can't be what you haven't seen. That little kitty who sees the image of himself as the image of Aslan, that, that little kitty's seen good. He's seen greatness. He's seen a future, so he can see it. But you can't be what you haven't seen. So don't tell folks God is good. Talk about what God has done <clears throat> that makes them say, really? That's your God? That's good. Talk about 
a God who sets the stars up in the sky. I mean, why would you consult the zodiac when you know the one who placed them up there, hung them, turned them on and off, told them when to come on, when to come off, knows every one of them? You, can, you worship him. Why consult the stars when you're on a first name basis with the one who hung them in the sky? The one who told the oceans how far to come up on the shore. The one who said, let's make a sun to rule the day. And every morning, that sun gets up. Like a father who hears a child say, do it again, daddy, do it again, daddy. And God says, and if you got up this morning and said there was no sun this morning, I was flying over here and there was a sun this morning. Up above the clouds, it was beautiful. And I finally looked at my person that was sitting next to me. I said, I think the fact that it's so beautiful up here means it's going to be kind of ugly down under there. But let me tell you, that sun was up and on the job. Talk about the mountains. Oh, you don't have any of those out here. I just kind of love being from the Midwest. Because what that means is God just sort of stumped right here so that they hit the Appalachians over there and we get the Rockies out over there. That's how I have it. So y'all run with me on that. Talk about the things that God has done, who has created this world. We made a mess of it. We make a mess of it. God is rewriting the story, editing the script. By the power of the Holy Spirit, God wants to rewrite our lives so that we become a glimpse of God's good in the world. That's what we proclaim. Don't tell folks your rules. Rules only work in relationship. When I was a kid, I went over to a friend of mine's house and she um, was folding her towels. Her mother had done laundry and she folded the towels and she folded it over once and twice. I was like, that's not how you fold a towel. Picked it up, you know, it was all wimpy and limpy. I said, that's not how you fold it. Let me show you how to fold it. You fold it over in thirds, and then you fold it over in thirds, and you can bounce a quarter off of that towel. <laughs> that's how you fold a towel. She said, no, 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 my mother taught me how to fold a towel. I said, my mother taught me to fold a towel. I went home and I realized that the reason my mother had taught me to fold a towel like that is because our linen shelves were narrow. <laughs> and if we only folded it over twice, it wouldn't fit on the linen shelf. Yeah. Rules only matter in right relationship. Mm -hmm. If you follow the rule of driving on the right side of the world, world in Germany, you will die. <laughs> <laughs> but when you talk about why we have the rules, a God who set things in order and wants that order to bring good in our life. The first can say, Really? That's pretty great. We say, yeah, God's like that. Give God big verbs. When you tell your testimony, make God the central actor. And I don't mean walking around saying, God told me, God told me, God told me, because I get scared. <laughs> I will tell you, God told me to go to Fuller. But I did not wake up and have coffee with God. I just realized that the psalmist was right, that God will give you the desires of your heart. And when you walk with God and know God and recognize where God shows up in your, in your life, you, you suddenly begin to realize that you want things. You don't know why you want them. And when you get there, you realize it's what God wanted for you all the time. God not only gives us the desires of our heart by fulfilling what we want, God gives us what to desire. And folks, that's good. If you love this verse, and it can be good or it can be bad, this fella told his sister to give him a minute. <laughs> Don't bother me, I'm looking for a verse of scripture to back up my one, one of my preconceived notions. <laughs> one of the verses we like to throw out at folks is a verse that says, for I know the plans he's made. I am.
ask you, do you know the context of Jeremiah 29? Mm -hmm. They were in exile. Mm -hmm. The wrong president had won the last election. <laughs> they got assigned to the wrong small group. They were not staying where they wanted to stay. They got sent away. And they asked, how are we supposed to be God's people in this godless land? And that's when the prophet Jeremiah said, this is what God wants you to do. Mary, have your sons and daughters marry and have children and build homes and plant gardens and pray for the people whose land you are in. For when they prosper, you're in their zip code, you prosper. For I know the plans I have for you. They are plans of hope and a future and not to harm you. You might be living in a world you don't want to be living in. It might not know the God we profess. It might not understand the world that we are living in. But our job is to counteract the amnesia that undermines so much of contemporary Christian expression. Our job is to be a people that causes the world to know it's not the church. Because the church is a community a community of truthfulness, a community of passion, a community that is going somewhere. We're not there yet. It's not an easy task that we have. It's been a long time from Bill Eason all the way through Rob Bell to the next one that's sitting in this room. The church is going to be cleaning out our attic. But right now, for this time, I, I, I'm going to take a scene from Star Wars and, and tell you you're not an orphan. You've got a story. You've got grandparents. Maybe. <laughs> I actually have to update that iPod. <laughs> but my question for you tonight, as we talk about this virtual reality that we live in, is what kind of people are we being? What kind of people are we forming? And my prayer for you is that you would be a preview of what God has done to edit your life. That's real. You don't have to make it up. Just talk about where God's shown up, shown out. Let your life be a testimony, a text message. I want to talk about that tomorrow. <laughs> a preview by the power of the Holy Spirit, edited by God, so that the world will know what they see now is not God's intention, but every good, every moment of joy, every episode of laughter, every anticipation of good is a glimpse of what God intends for all creation. We just work for him. Pray with me. God, we thank you for the reality we live in. We thank you, Lord, that it's not a game. We thank you, Lord, that even in the horrors that are real for us, they're nothing like Suzanne Collins' world. And we thank you, God, that we found the story of your truth 
faithful. May those who come behind us find you because we are faithful. In Jesus' name we pray.